वेलकम बैक सो वी आर इन मॉड्यूल फाइव लेक्चर वन एंड वील बी टॉकिंग अबाउट द कोगुलेशन प्रेसिपिटेशन एंड रिमूवल ऑफ द हेवी मेटल्स बाई यूजिंग प्रेसिपिटेशन एंड कोगुलेशन प्रॉकुलेशन मैथड्स सो द कंसेप्ट कवर्ड इन दिस लेक्चर विल बी द फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ द कोगुलेशन एंड प्रॉकुलेशन प्रोसेस द कोलोडल पार्टिकल्स विच आर फाउंड इन वेस्ट वाटर विच नीड्स टू बी रिमूव बाई कोगुलेशन एंड प्रॉकुलेशन प्रोसेस the factors affecting coagulation and flocculation process and the particle solvent interaction that happens when the particles like colloidal particles are present in a solvent the solvent in this case may be the water so because we are talking of the water and waste water treatment so how the particles they interact with the solvent so that we are going to discuss in this lecture so all of you know that the removal of the heavy metals can take place by ion exchange process the adsorption process that we have studied earlier also similarly we can also use the membrane processes for the removal of the metals and we can also use the method like precipitation coagulation flocculation for the removal of the metals uh, which can be utilized by a number of industries so we are going to cover today about the coagulation and flocculation process first of all so the waste water can be a mixture of variety of solids where basically we can have the suspended solids and the dissolved solids so we have already studied about the suspended solids and dissolved solids in the characterization of the waste water lecture so here also we can mainly classify the solids into two parts that is we can have the suspended solids we can have the dissolved solids where the suspended solids are larger and heavier particles that may settle under the influence of the gravity and they have a size above 1 micrometer and they can be visible by the naked eyes they include the sand grit and larger organic particles so dissolved solids are the solids which are generally less than 1 nanometer in size and they are too small to be seen by the naked eyes they may contain the solids which are created by the organic materials such as sugars proteins humic substances in organic substances also like for example salts the dissolved metals as well as the dissolved gases so they all serve as a dissolved solids in the water similarly we can have colloidal particles which may range from 1 micrometer to 1 nanometer so the particles lying between 1 nanometer and 1 micrometer are called the colloidal solids and they are having the size which lies in between the true solution and the suspension so that's why they remain Uh, dispersed in the solution and they do not settle quickly and that's why they are known as the colloidal solids and they are termed as the non settleable solids and that's why we have to use a number of chemicals so that these type of solids can be removed from the water or waste water and they contribute to the turbidity of the water and these colloidal solids that's why they are very difficult to be removed by the cavitation process so you can see here that when the water sample may contain different type of solids for example when we evaporate the water sample we can get the total solids which are there which comprises of the total suspended solids and the total dissolved solids and these solids can be differentiated by use of the filtration method so the whatever remains on the filter paper so that contributes to the total suspended solids whatever goes into the filtrate so that is contributes to the total dissolved solids and similarly these total suspended solids and total dissolved solids may be further classified into volatile suspended solids and fixed suspended solids as well as the volatile dissolved solids and fixed dissolved solids where the volatile means the organic parts and the fixed means the inorganic part similarly the sample of the water may also contain the solids which can settle down within one hour so we use imof cone so that we can find out the solids which are also known as the settleable solids so the main concern here is the solids which are colloidal in nature which cannot settle down on their own which do not settle down by the gravitational technique so when we go for the fundamental of chemical coagulation so the colloidal particles that are found in the waste water so they have got a negative charge on their surface and this negative charge basically leads to the repulsion of the different particles when they come closer to each other so this repelling force because of the electrical charge it dominates over the attractive body force the particles they come near to each other so they may be repelled because of the electrical charge which is present on the surface that is the negative charge 
whereas wonderwall force which may be there if the particles are coming close to each other so the wonderwall force is not as high as the repelling force and because of which the particles they do not collide and these particles may not settle down and because of which they remain in the suspension and they keep moving in the suspension because of the brownian motion the brownian motion refers to the constant thermal bombardment of the collider particle by the relatively smaller water molecules so the coagulation is the process in which we destabilize the colloidal particles because we know that the when the particles they are stabilized they are having the negatively charged on the surface so when they come closer to each other also then also they will not settle down so they are more or less stabilized so the coagulation process means that we want to destabilize this particle so that as soon as they come closer to each other then the wonderwall forces they can act and the attraction can happen and because now the charge is not there so it will now collide and they will settle down that is the particle size will increase and because of the increasing particle size these particles can settle down so coagulation is a very complex process and it depends upon the characteristics of the water so the characteristics of the water may change with the season it changes daily also right so it is necessary that we fix the dose of a coagulant that is needed so that we can achieve the maximum removal of these colloidal particles so the different type of coagulants or flocculants which are present so they may be the natural and synthetic organic polymers they may be metals such as alum and ferric sulfate they can be pre hydrolyzed metal salts such as polyammonium chloride or polyiron chlorides so the fundamentals of the chemical coagulation so there are certain definitions that we need to understand so for example the first is the coagulation that is coagulation is the process of the chemical destabilization of the particle and this can happen if we are adding a certain chemical to it so that the charge which is there on the particle so it can be neutralized and then the particles can be chemically destabilized so this process is known as coagulation similarly the flocculation refers to the process by which the particle size can increase as a result of the particle collision so flocculation means that is we are bringing these particles nearer to each other so that as soon as they are destabilized they can come closer to each other and then the wonderwall forces may play a important role and because of which the particles can collide and these particles can settle down so the flocculation means that is we are providing a mixing to the system so that these particles may come closer they can collide and then they can settle down and similarly the coagulant are the chemical salts which are added so that we can destabilize the colloidal particles flocculant are also the chemical polymers that can be added so that we can increase the flock formation so there can be different type of flocculation for example we can have micro flocculation we can have macro flocculation micro flocculation means that is particle aggregation may take place because of the thermal motion of the fluid molecules and which is also known as a brownian motion so because of the brownian motion these particles may come closer to each other and then because as they are destabilized already so they can form flock so this process is called micro flocculation whereas macro flocculation means the providing a mixing in the fluid or providing velocity gradient so that the particles may come closer to each other they come in contact with each other and then they can be flocculated and they can settle out from the mixture macro flocculation can also be brought out by differential settling for example if we are having a bigger particle size and we are having smaller particles so bigger particles will, will uh, settle fast whereas the smaller particle will settle at a lower velocity so these two particles when they come closer to each other during this settlement so they can collide and then they can form a bigger particle and then they can settle down at a higher velocity so this is also known as the macro flocculation and this happens due to the differential settlement of these larger and the smaller particles so we can see here that a coagulant is added and, and we know that the colloidal particles they are having negatively charged on their surface so the coagulant may be ad added which is positively charged and then these uh, coagulant can neutralize the charges on the surface of the particles and as soon as these particles will come closer to each other they can form flock and similarly we can also add a polymeric flocculant which is nothing but a polymer so these polymers can also bind these particles together and then it can help in the formation of a bigger flock and then ultimately these flocks can settle down 
So there are a number of important factors which influences the coagulation and flocculation process. The coagulation and flocculation process is used to aggregate the colloidal particles so that they can form bigger particles and then it will be easier for us to remove or separate out these particles from the liquid. So there are a number of factors which can influence this process. For example, first is the particle size and the numbers of the colloidal particles. For example, the particle size of the colloidal uh, particles, it ranges from times for minus 3 micrometers to 1 micrometers. So these particle size, it influences the properties as well as the behavior of the entire colloidal systems. Because we know that the smaller particle size, they are more stable, they are having higher charge and that is why they are resistant to coagulation and flocculation process. Because they are having a larger surface area also as well as the larger charge, so this makes them more resistant towards the coagulation and flocculation process. The larger particles they are likely to aggregate because they are having smaller charge and basically the large particles can also come closer to each other and then basically it will be easier for us to aggregate in comparison to the smaller colloidal particles. Similarly, the number of particles will also affect the coagulation and flocculation process because as the number of particles will increase, the chances to come closer to each other will be higher and in that case the process of coagulation and flocculation may be efficient. But if the number of particles they are smaller, so then in that case the chances of coming closer to each other, though they are destabilized, then also it will be very very difficult for us to remove these particles by settling because they will not come closer to each other and uh, they will not basically coalesce and they will not form flocks and that is why they will not settle down also. So they remain suspended in the solution for a longer time. So that is why the less number of particles, they, it adversely affects the coagulation and flocculation process. So particle shape and flexibility also impacts the coagulation and flocculation process. For example, we can have variety of shapes of the colloidal particles which depends upon their composition, which depends upon the manufacturing process, which depends upon their environmental conditions. So we can have different type of shapes. For example, we can have spherical shape, we can have semi-spherical shape, ellipsoids or rods or random coils. So number of shapes basically can be there and these shapes of the particles, it can have a significant impact on the behavior, the interactions and the applications and it will affect the electrical properties, the particle to particle interactions as well as the particle solvent interactions and ultimately it will impact the process of coagulation and flocculation. So that is why it is very very important for us to analyze that what dose of coagulant needs to be added so that we can effectively remove such type of particle. The nature of the colloidal particles is also important in the sense that the composition and nature of colloidal particles depends like the surface chemistry and the structure so it can also impact the coagulation and flocculation process. So understanding and controlling these factors will lead to the optimization of the coagulation population process for various type of water as well as wastewater treatment as well as the industrial wastewater treatments. The particle charge is also an important factor because we know that the electrostatic charge which is present on the colloidal particles, it plays a very very significant role because the light particles which are having the similar charge, so they will be having a force of repulsion and this will repel their aggregation and the particles will not be able to coalesce and they will not be able to remove from the system. And similarly, it is also very important to note that the charge neutralization becomes very very necessary when we want to remove these particles which are having charge on their surface. So the charge neutralization can be achieved by adding a certain type of coagulant which can reduce the repulsion between the like charges which are there on the particles. Similarly, the pH of the solution can also affect the coagulation and flocculation process because the pH affects the charge on the colloidal particles. So as the pH changes, so the charge on the particles may also change and there may be a certain pH at which the, the charge may become equal to zero. So there may be alternation of the charge depending upon the pH. So it may be negative for some time and then uh, at a certain pH the charge may become equal to zero which is also called as uh, point of zero charge and after which the charge on the particle may be reversed, right. So in that case it is very very important to find out that at what pH or at what specific pH ranges the 
maximum coagulation and flocculation can take place or the maximum neutralization of the particles can take place and then uh, they can coalesce and then they can coagulate out from the uh, wastewater or the water. Similarly, the ionic strength of the solution also plays a very important role because in the presence of the ions, the solution can influence the stability of the colloidal particles. So, and we are having very high ionic strength, so it can shield the repulsive forces which are present and this basically can promote the aggregation of the particles. Similarly, the high ionic strength can also compress the double layer which is formed around the charged colloidal particles. So, the compression of the double layer may also lead uh, to the coagulation of, of the particles and the particles may be removed from the system. For example, you must have seen that as the river meets the sea, so estuary is formed, so there you will find that a number of particles they basically settle out because of the very high ionic strength of the sea when it merges with the uh, river water which is having a very low ionic strength. So in that case, the compression of double layer takes place and a delta formation or the estuary formation takes place because of the settlement of these particles which are uh, charged in nature and because of the high ionic strength, so they settle out from the water. The temperature can also affect because the temperature impacts the kinetic energy of the particles. So it will increase the rate of the collisions and the interaction between the particles and it will facilitate the flocculation process and then basically it will also enhance the coagulation and flocculation of the particles. The concentration of the coagulant and flocculant also will decide the efficiency of the coagulation and flocculation process because the coagulants are used so that we can neutralize the surfaces and then the particles can come closer to each other, the particles can form larger flocks and then they can settle down. So it is very, very important to decide the dose, that is how much dose of the coagulant or flocculant is needed so that the efficient coagulation and flocculation process can happen and the particles can settle down and the turbidity of the solution can be reduced. For example, if we are adding a coagulant because the coagulant is neutralizing the charges which are there on the surface, suppose a particle is having a negative charge on the surface and we are using a coagulant which is having a positive charge, so then it will neutralize the negative charge on the particles up to a certain dose and after which it will reverse the charge which is there on the particles. For example, when we are adding the positive charge and a higher amount of positive charge may again induce the charge reversal on the particles and the particles may get converted to instead of the negative charge, they may be converted to the positive charge. So then again they will be repelling each other because of the similar charge and that's why the coagulation and flocculation process will fail. So that's why its effectiveness uh, depends upon the specific characteristics of the colloidal system. So the shear forces are also very important. For example, agitation or shear forces, they can hinder the aggregation process. So it is very, very necessary that, that when we are going for the agitation or mixing, we have to see that at what level of mixing is to be adopted so that the aggregation process may not be prevented by the particles because of the higher agitation or higher shear forces, these particles may be again separated out or the, the flocks that is formed, they may again be broken because of which the coagulation and flocculation process may be hampered. So we have to adjust the level of agitation so that we can get a highest efficiency of the coagulation flocculation process. So the time of contact also is a very, very important factor because if we allow the particles to have a sufficient contact time so that they can interact, they can aggregate and then they can be removed from the system. So it is very, very important that the retention time to be decided beforehand before we go for the actual removal of these colloidal particles from the water or wastewater solutions uh, by conducting certain tests at the laboratory scale so that we can know that what should be the maximum amount of contact time that should be provided so that the efficient aggregation of these particles can take place. Similarly, the presence of other chemicals like the dissolved ions or organic matter, so they also can interfere with the process of the coagulation flocculation. They can enhance the process also, whereas some substances they can interfere with the process also. For example, if we are having the higher uh, concentration of the ions, so it may in increase the process of the coagulation flocculation, whereas the some other materials where basically we are having the charge reversal is taking place or some other interactions are taking place. So it may also 
interfere with the process of the coagulation and flock collection. Similarly, the particle solvent interaction is also a very important process when we are talking of the coagulation and flock collection process. So, here the interaction between the colloidal particles and the solvent it is very very crucial and it influences the stability and behavior of the colloidal system. So, we can have three type of particles which are found uh, in the liquids depending upon the nature of the particle and solvent interaction. For example, we can have the hydrophobic or the water hating, we can have the hydrophilic particles which are water loving and similarly we can have the association collides. And here the solvent is water so that is why we are using the term of hydrophobic and hydrophilic that is the water hating and water loving colloids which are present in the water. So, the first two types are based on the attraction of the particles surface for the water. For example, hydrophobic means it is basically uh, having a lesser attraction or it is having little attraction to, uh, for the water whereas the hydrophilic means it is having a greater attraction for the water molecules. Then the third type of colloids is also known as the association colloids which is surface active agents like soap, detergent, dye stuffs and they form a organized aggregate which is also called the micelles and these particles are also known as the amphilic colloids and because they possess two groups that is the they possess the polar group also as well as the non-polar group also for example the polar group is hydrophilic in nature and the non-polar group is hydrophobic in nature so as the concentration of these particles that is these amphipilic colloids it increases so they form a micelle that is when the concentration increases above the critical micelle concentration so they may form such type of uh, micelle structure where the head which is hydrophilic in nature so it basically is towards the water whereas the tail which is having hydrophobic characteristics so they aggregate together and they form a micelle structure in the water. So nature of these interactions is described in terms of the particle solvent interaction potential and the different type of interactions that are involved in the colloidal system they include first of all is the van der Waal forces about which we are talking earlier also. So these van der Waal forces they are weak attractive forces and they may arise from the temporary fluctuation in the electron distribution around the particles. For example, if we are having two atoms here atom 1 and atom 2 when they come closer to each other. So they may be polarized and they may have a attractive forces in between them and which are very very weak attractive forces and this is known as the van der Waal forces. So these forces they may contribute to the attraction between the colloidal particles and the surrounding solvent also and they may basically lead to the aggregation of these uh, particles and these forces may become very very prominent as the distance decreases between the two particles. Similarly we can have electrostatic interactions where we can have the electrical charge on the surface of the particles and because of these electrical charge if the charges are similar so they can be repulsive whereas the charges are different so there can be attractive force between these two particles. So the particles repel when basically they are brought closer to each other right uh, when they are having the similar charges whereas they will attract each other when they are having the different charges and this will also determine the stability of the colloidal system because if the particles they are having the different charges then they, it is easier for us to coalesce the system whereas if the particles they are having same charges so then it is very very difficult uh, for us to uh, coagulate and flocculate these particles together. So the forces between these two particles can be determined by using the electrostatic force equation and this electrostatic force equation says that the charges on the particle that is q1 and q2 divided by the square of the distance between these two particles and into the Coulomb's constant or the electrostatic constant so it is equal to the force between these two particles. So that is how the electrostatic force can be calculated when there are electrostatic interactions between the particles. Similarly there can be hydration forces that is the water it may form a structure layer around the colloidal particles and this may also lead to the hydration forces and these hydration forces also play a very very important role in the particle solvent interactions. Similarly, we can have steric stabilization where a layer of the adsorbed molecules such as polymers or suspectants so they may create a barrier that may prevent the aggregation of the colloidal particles together. 
so the steric hindrance may also help in maintaining the stability by resisting the attractive forces but it may also reduce the efficiency of the coagulation and flocculation processes similarly solvent structure also plays a very very important role where the structure and properties of solvent it can also impact the colloidal stability for example the dielectric constant of the solvent as well as it affects the electrostatic interactions between the particles and the viscosity of the solvent can also influence the rate of the particle motion and collision and it may also hamper the movement of the particles if the viscosity of the solvent is high. Similarly, there can be other specific interactions. For example, we can have hydrogen bonding or chemical bonding. So they can occur between the colloidal particles and certain solvents. So they also can be lead to the decline in the efficiency of the coagulation and flocculation because these interactions are much, much stronger they are higher than the Van der Waal forces that we have discussed just now and they can significantly influence the stability and behavior of the colloidal system. So understanding and controlling these particle solvent interactions, so they are very, very necessary so that we can manipulate the stability of the colloidal dispersion. For example, suppose we are working on the drug delivery or we are going for the nanoparticle synthesis. So in that case, it is very, very important for us to choose an appropriate solvent so that desired colloidal stability can be achieved and we can have a stable suspension made out of it. For example, suppose we are manufacturing the nanoparticles and let's say the nanoparticles are made up of iron. So in that case, if we are not choosing a proper solvent, in that case, the particles may collise, they may uh, condense with each other uh, because of the magnetic forces which are there and this may result in the increase in the size and the particles may not no longer be the nano size. So that's why it is very, very important to find an appropriate solvent so that we can disperse the particles depending on their applications. Similarly, the knowledge of the colloid and interface science is also very, very important so that we can design and optimize the colloidal system for specific applications. So now development and measurement of surface charge is also important in the coagulation and flocculation process. For example, the surface charge is developed in different ways depending upon the chemical composition of the medium and the nature of the colloids. For example, the surface charge development can be because of different factors and for example, we can have isomorphous replacement, we can have structural imperfections, we can have preferential adsorptions, we can have ionizations. Surface charges are needed to be overcome if these particles are need to be aggregated and settled down. So we need to find out the factors which are responsible for the surface charge development. For example, isomorphous replacement means that the ions which are present in the lattice structure of the particles, for example, when we talk of the clay or the soil particles, so these ions which are present in the in their lattice structure, so they may be replaced with the ions from the solution. So that is called the isomorphous replacement. Whereas the structural imperfections also can lead to the charge development. For example, when we are having broken bonds on the crystal edge, or when we are having imperfections on the formation of the crystal. So it can also lead to the charge development on the particles. For example, when we talk of the clay particles or similar type of particles, so structural imperfections can also lead to the charge development. We can have preferential adsorption also, which can lead to the charge development. For example, the ions from the surrounding solution, they can adsorb onto the surface of the colloidal particles. And this may result in the electrical double layer formation where the outer layers of the ions they carry a charge which is opposite to the that of the particle charge so it basically creates surface charge on the particles for example when we talk of the oil droplets or gas bubbles or any other chemical inert substances which are dispersed in water so they may have a negative charge which can be developed because of the preferential adsorption of the anions which are present in the solution or in the water Similarly, ionization can also lead to the charge development. For example, many colloidal particles, they may possess a certain functional groups which can ionize in the solution. For example, we can have hydroxyl ions, hydroxyl groups, we can have amino groups or we can have carboxyl groups. So they may undergo ionization as they go into the solvent and this may lead to the development of charge on the particle sur surfaces. For example, when we talk of proteins or microorganisms, so they may acquire the charge to the ionization of the carboxyl and amino groups. So that's how the charge development takes place on the surface of the colloidal particles 
and that's why it is very important for us to analyze that how the charge development is taking place, what type of charges are there uh, on the particles and what type of coagulant or flocculant we need to add so that we can destabilize the particles and these particles can ultimately be removed from the system. These are the references that we have used during the preparation of this lecture and we stop here and we'll talk about the coagulation flocculation process in detail in the coming lecture. Thank you.